Hey Team PCAM and welcome to lecture where today we are going to talk about applications and implications of the hydrogen atom wave function. So the last two lectures we spent a laborious process trying to derive the wave function for atoms with only one electron which we called hydrogen like atoms. And we eventually arrived at a set of solutions to Schrodinger's equation for these one electron atoms and they took the form psi, which depends on three quantum numbers, n, l, and m sub l, and is represented in spherical coordinates. So using r, our radius, phi, our angle, and theta, our azimuth angle, that wave function is represented by a portion called the radial wave function, and for which we've tabulated those in previous lectures, what some possible functions are for different values of n and l, and then we multiply that by an angular wave function, which is the spherical harmonics. Those are also a set of tabulated wave functions. And as we learned in two lectures ago in our particle on a sphere, those spherical harmonics look awfully similar to the shapes of orbitals that we now are coming to associate with what hydrogen looks like. And so for our quantum numbers, we know that these quantum numbers have traditional names in the literature they also have restrictions on what values these integers can take. And so what we learned in last lecture is that n, our principal quantum number, can be any positive integer, l is an angular momentum quantum number, and valid solutions to Schrodinger's equation always have l be less than n. So n equals 3, n e l equals 2 is a perfectly valid wave function, but n equals 3, n e l equals 4 is not. So L can take on values anywhere starting between 0 at a minimum all the way up to n minus 1. And then last but not least, we have M sub L, our magnetic quantum number. And just like with L, M sub L is going to depend on what values L can take on. So if we have a wave function that has n equals 4, L equals 2, M sub L is restricted to values, integer values, between negative L and positive L. So if L equals 2, m sub l, for instance, could take on values negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, or 2. And then the very last thing that we learned in the last lecture series was that the energy associated with a given solution to Schrodinger's equation, so a wave function, psi, n, l, m sub l, is given by the expression, um, this energy expression, I've written it down in a couple different ways, just so you can see both in its pure formula times a bunch of physical constants as well as what the numbers would be if you wanted to treat this numerically and do so in as simple a way as possible. Now the energy ultimately is dependent on only one of the three quantum numbers. It's dependent on n and it's inversely proportional to n squared. These energies are all negative because the Coulombic attraction between the electron and the positively charged nucleus is always going to be an attractive interaction, hence a negative energy. And so for our energy, this energy represents the total energy that the electron has when it's in a stationary state, a wave function, or if you like better in chemistry terms, an orbital. And so for example, an electron in a 2p orbital in a lithium 2 plus cation would have an energy described by negative z squared in this case, z is 3 because we're talking about lithium and lithium's atomic number is 3. So negative 3 squared over 2 squared, that 2 squared coming becomes n equals 2, times our constant in joules to give us a, what seemed to be a very small but negative energy in joules. The reason this number is so small is because normally as chemists we're thinking about energies per mole or per Avogadro number of particles, 10 to the negative, 10 times, 6 times 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles. Here, we're talking about the energy of one electron in one atom, so it's going to be small. Though we've done this derivation at this point, there are still an awful lot of questions that we haven't been able to address. And most of those relate to the, chemists that, the questions that are most interesting to us as chemists. And so today, we're going to try and explore more about this wave function and this energy that we saw in the last couple lectures. And to guide our thinking, I want to start off not with a set of lecture goals, but maybe a set of guiding questions for our lecture that we're going to explore today through a little bit of lecture and a little bit of practice problems 
and sandbox exploration. And so our guiding questions are going to be, first of all, what does this wave function look like? How do we visualize it? How do we graph it? How do we describe it? Math formulas are rarely intuitive for any of us, and so we're going to try and graph the wave function in order to get a best determination of what these wave functions really look like. Second off, I've told you what the quantum numbers are, but we don't necessarily know what they mean. How does psi change as the quantum numbers change? What effect does this have on our energy? How do I correlate each of these different quantum numbers to some intuitive, chemically meaningful description of what this quantum number means for an orbital in the hydrogen atom? The, la the third question that we want to tackle for today is, well, now that we've done all this work, we've in GChem we introduced the Bohr model, we introduced Schrodinger's equation, you may have seen one of those planetary solar models of an electron around a proton, but can Schrodinger's equation finally answer for us in detail and with complete accuracy where the electron is in a hydrogen atom? Does it matter where the electron is if I change my quantum numbers? Do I need to think for this problem in terms of probabilities for observing an electron in a specific point in space or a specific distance from the nucleus? So we're going to connect this to our topics of probability and, uh, and physical observables, just like we did for the particle in a box, but now also for this hydrogen atom. And then last but not least, just as with the particle in a box, we can talk about processes of light absorption and emission in the hydrogen atom. And so our last topic for today's lecture will be to discuss energy transitions for the hydrogen atom and how that relates to experimentally observed wavelengths that you can see from a hydrogen emission spectrum. All right, and with that, let's go ahead and get going. So if we're going to describe the wave function, it's sometimes helpful to break the wave function up into its two product components. And so because the radial wave function only depends on one independent variable, little r, this is something that we're going to start off with because it's something that we can actually plot on a sheet of paper by hand. And it's really helpful for us to start thinking about how this wave function changes as we get close or far away from the nucleus. And so that's where we're going to begin our discussion before we talk about the full three-dimensional wave function. So I'm going to postulate this via example. We have a radial wave function for, two, for R20 that I looked up from our tabulated values. So this would correspond to a 2s orbital. And that 2, 0 function is equal to a number of physical constants times a polynomial term, 2 minus r over a naught, the Bohr radius in this case, times a decaying exponential. So we have e to the negative r over 2 a naught. And one thing that really putting in our math skills and our root finding skills into practice, we can take this function and try and sketch it out by hand before we use a computer program to plot it for us. When we sketch functions, there's normally a strategy that mathematicians like to use for us to best capture the salient features of this wave function. In particular, I want to know what happens close to my two different asymptotic limits. In one case, I want to know what happens right at the nucleus at little r equals zero, and I also want to know what happens as r goes to infinity as I get farther and farther away from the nucleus. A second thing that I want to know as a mathematician and a chemist is where are there nodes in this function? Are there places where r20 is equal to zero? And then last but not least, it's really helpful and we want to figure out where is this wave function positive and where is it negative? And so we're going to start off with our asymptotic limits. So at r equals zero, I'm going to take notes here in orange for us, our polynomial term um, is going to be left as a constant so 2, and e to the 0 is just 1. And so r0 appears to be a positive number. And you can see in my sketch that I'm not super worried about what that positive constant is, but I am interested in saying that this is a positive value and I'll kind of go from there. What about r approaches infinity? Well, in this case, I see that my wave function is going to still be this product of a constant, which doesn't matter too much, times a polynomial term. That polynomial appears to be getting 
increasingly more and more negative, but then it's multiplied by this decaying exponential. And if you know what the shape of a decaying exponential looks like, it tends towards zero as r approaches infinity. And in fact, it decays to zero faster than this polynomial term is able to approach negative infinity. So the asymptotic behavior of this function is going to be that as r approaches infinity, our wave function, our radial wave function, is going to approach zero. Next up, we want to establish whether or not there's any nodes in this function. And if you remember from your math classes back in middle school or high school, to find nodes, we need to find out where r20 is equal to zero, meaning that I've got my constant, which doesn't matter, so I'm going to immediately throw it out if that's all right. And I want to see where this combined polynomial term times my decaying exponential might be equal to zero. And for root finding, that means that either the term 2 minus r over a naught is equal to zero, or the term e to the negative r over 2a naught is equal to zero. We already determined that that decaying exponential, when it goes to zero, that's when r is equal to infinity. So we've already accounted for that. But the polynomial term, in order for that to be zero, well, that means that 2 has to be equal to r over a naught. In other words, r at two bore lengths, that's where this radial wave function is equal to zero. And so two bore lengths is really not that much. It's about an angstrom. And so I'm going to mark it down on our paper, but I'm going to put it pretty close to our nuclear, um, our r equals zero point. And then the last thing that we need to do is we sort of need to connect the dots. Where is this wave function positive? Where is it negative? And we know that a node is where this wave function is going to switch places. So I, in this case, can determine that between 0 and 2a0, the wave function is positive but decaying towards 0. Then it becomes negative for a little while. You may notice that if, two, if r is bigger than 2a0, that my polynomial term is negative, giving me an overall negative wave function. And then slowly over time, this decays back towards zero. And no one has accused me of being very good at art, but we can sketch out what that wave function looks like as follows. Positive goes to negative and then decays back to zero is what this wave function looks like. And then that makes our second question pretty easy. Does R20 have any radial nodes? Um, yes. We don't count the bounds of the problems. We don't count anything that's happening at r0 or r infinity. So in this case, we have one node, and that node occurs at two bore lengths. Okay. So graphing by hand is nice, especially if you're in a context where you don't have access to a computer, like on a test or at a conference, maybe if you're trying to figure out what a graph looks like. But Graphing by hand is not our only option, and computer software can also help us with this task. So I spent some time yesterday writing a Python notebook for us that is going to allow us to see some code that computes these radial wave functions exactly. I am going to upload this for us to be able to play with as a class, and so I encourage you to download this Jupyter Notebook and actually follow along with the Jupyter Notebook and the little interactive sliders that I've created for us as we go through a set of guiding questions, mostly so that you can see how these wave functions, these radial wave functions change for different values of n and l and get to experience that for yourself. And so switching over to my computer screen, what you see here is my classic Python notebook. And I am going to briefly show you the source code, but then mostly focus on the graphical I put a little bit of the theoretical detail that we've gone over. What is the radial wave function? Here are some tabulated values for it, which you can also see um, that are, match up with what we talked about earlier today. And our source code in Python is a way of showing that this, normal, this radial wave function is a normalization term. That is where all of your messy but important constants show up at the front of the expression multiplied by some polynomial called the Legere polynomial. 
and then also multiplied by a term that is essentially r raised to the power of l times an exponential term. So here's my exponential term, here's my factor of r raised to the power of l. So we can plot this using Python and matplotlib, and what I want to focus on for this plot is how this varies as a function of n and l. So let's go ahead and start with this 2s orbital so that we can kind of check how good my art skills are at depicting this wave function. And so just like we showed in the mathematical or the handwritten treatment, we have a node showing up at this function at two bore lengths. We have the wave function starting off positive, going negative for a little bit, and then decaying back to zero. So all of the essential features are the same, but now it's kind of nice because this is numerically accurate for what this wave function looks like. And so then the question for us becomes, well, what then are, can I look at this wave function and notice some patterns in terms of n and l and how that impacts the shape of the radial wave function? And hopefully do so in a way that's much easier than just staring at the math expressions themselves. And we can do that. And so what I want to do is show you just a little bit of this radial wave function with some guiding questions to lead us. And I'm going to try and put both the sliders and my screen, my iPad screen, up on the same point, and hopefully that'll work for us. So again, if you have this Jupyter Notebook downloaded for yourself, what I want you to do is go ahead and pull that up alongside this lecture and pause the video when I tell you to do so. If you don't have your Jupyter Notebook open or you can't open it for some reason, I'll go ahead and do some sandbox exploration of these so that you can see the wave function changing for yourself. But here's our first guiding question. Let's go ahead and keep L constant. And I'm going to pick L equals zero, but you can pick any value of L that you like. And we want to try and do some pattern matching for how the number of radial nodes in my radial wave function changes as N increases. So if you have your Jupyter Notebook, go ahead and pause the video at this point and see if you can answer this question for yourself. How does the number of radial nodes in R change as N increases, but L is held constant? Okay, so playing around with these sliders, I see that my 1s orbital, so N is equal to 1, has no nodes in it. Again, because I'm not counting R equals 0 or R equals infinity. If I go up to N equals 2, I see that I have one radial node present. That was the one that was at 2 bore. n equals 3. Now I see one radial node somewhere close to 2 bore, might be 2 bore, and then one between 5 and 10 bore. So now I have two radial nodes. n equals 4. I see three radial nodes. And so overall, I can pattern match this and say that apparently the number of nodes For L equals 0 is n minus 1. So n, the number of nodes increases as n increases, but it's kind of off by a factor of 1. The second question that we might then answer is sort of the complementary question. Now if we keep n constant but we change L, how then does the number of radial nodes change? So again, if you have this notebook open, go ahead and pause the video and play around with this to see if you can answer the question for yourself. All right, so as I increase L, for L is equal to zero, we've already done this one, I see three nodes present. If I increase L by one, now for N is equal to four, L is equal to one, I have one, two nodes present. So L appears to be decreased. As I increase L, that appears to be decreasing the number of nodes that I have. L equals two, now I only have one node left over. L equals three, no nodes present in this 4f orbital. L equals four, oh, not allowed. That would um, have me have N and L have the same value, so that one does not have negative one nodes, it just doesn't exist as a solution to Schrodinger's equation. And so what we can write down is number of nodes 
for L, or excuse me, N equals 4, was apparently given by the formula 4 minus L minus 1, right? So let's make sure that that matches what our exploration was seeing. So L is 0, I see 3 nodes, perfect, that works with this formula. L equals 1, 2 nodes, good. L equals 2, 1 node, perfect. And L equals 3, 0 nodes present. And so hopefully you can see that then our kind of simple algebraic formula for figuring out how many nodes would I expect to be present in a wave function with quantum numbers n and l is going to be that my number of nodes, my number of radial nodes, I should clarify, is equal to n minus l minus 1. So n has a positive impact on the number of nodes present. L has a negative impact on that same process. Now that we've explored R, our radial wave function a little bit, it's time to try and go big and explore what the overall wave function looks like in three dimension. And this is really important because obviously the radial wave function is only a portion of the true hydrogen wave function, but unfortunately, psi depends on three coordinates and especially if we want to consider psi as a fourth variable that we need to display, it's our dependent variable, but still one that we need to display, plotting functions in four dimensions is just tricky. And so chemists have tried a lot of different methods for visualization, many of which you have seen before in GChem, but also many of which I expect are not familiar in, to us in terms of the associated meaning with that wave function or why the visualization looks the way it does. So one of my goals for today's lecture is to take many pictures of wave functions that you've seen before and actually connect it to the physical interpretation of the wave function, the sign of the wave function, and allow us to get a lot more information from that process than we would be able to otherwise when we were back in our GChem days. So of the different methods, I'm going to start off with my favorite, and my favorite method is one that takes essentially all the information that you could want about the wave function. It is going to use computer software. We can plot something in 3D by having us be able to look at and then rotate the hydrogenic orbital. And that takes care of three of our variables. So in this case, our spatial coordinates, R, phi, and theta. But what about psi? Their solution in this visualization of the hydrogen and wave functions is to represent the sign of psi using colors. So we'll use one color for positive, one color for negative, and then to represent the magnitude of psi using brightness. So let's go ahead and look at exactly what we can learn from a plot that would look something along these lines. So I'm gonna post a link in the comments so that you can look at this website. It is an applet that uses Java in order to visualize these hydrogen wave functions. And because we started off with R20 in our example, I've also started off our discussion with R20 or the, the 2s orbital wave function. So there's some options that you can play with in this applet. We have sliders to tell us what value of n we're interested in, sliders to tell us what value of L we're interested in. Note that we're at n equals 2, so we're pretty restricted in terms of what values of L we can explore at this point. And then there's going to be a third slider that indirectly tells us about the value of m sub L. And we'll get to that in a second. And so on this graph, remember from our discussion of the radial wave function that the wave function started off positive for a pretty small radius regime transition through a node, through, so through the zero point, became negative, and then slowly decayed back out to zero. That information is all represented in this version of a three-dimensional hydrogen atom. So as you might expect for an s orbital, it's spherically symmetric, so I'm rotating my coordinate axis right now, but you can't tell because it's spherically symmetric. As soon as we get to a p orbital, you'll see what the difference is when I try and drag around this slider. The red color represents a positive value of the wave function in this case. And as we go farther and farther away from the nucleus, we see that transition from positive 
through zero. So the through zero part is because you can see because the wave function goes um, through a, like a little tiny black region representing our radial wave, our radial node, and then is slightly negative at intermediate distances, rather negative at moderate distances away from the nucleus, and then over time decays back to zero. What I really like about this plot is that it shows you both the inside of the orbital and the outside of the orbital. So not just, you know, big values of R, but it shows you what's happening throughout the whole orbital as we traverse R. It's also helping us see that the wave function does get to be positive and negative through color. And through brightness, you can see that the electron, remember our value of psi, once we square it, is going to be very related to our probability of seeing an electron somewhere. You can see that this electron in a 2s orbital, at least qualitatively, seems to spend a fair amount of time close to the nucleus, not very much time in this kind of no man's land here near the radial node, and then also a large amount of its time, maybe the most of its time, in a moderate radius away from the nucleus represented by this blue region. Now let's go ahead and play around and see how n and l and m sub l affect what these three-dimensional wave functions look like. So the first thing I'm going to do is, without rescaling the size of this plot, go to n equals 1, and what I want you to see is that this 1s orbital, 1, it's the value of the wave function is strictly positive everywhere, so we have a red color throughout, no blue showing up, but 2, it's quite a bit smaller than our 2s orbital. And so we should, in a, later on in the lecture, look into that a little bit more but we're seeing a correlation between n and the size of our orbital, or kind of the maximum distance where it's reasonably likely to find the electron away from the nucleus. As I increase my value of n, you can see that now my 3s orbital, I have to rescale my axes in order to see the whole orbital, so it's much bigger than the 2s orbital. You can also see the two radial nodes that show up, so we go from positive through a radial node to a negative region of the wave function, through another radial node to a yet another positive region of the wave function. And then just like all these other orbitals, it's going to decay to zero over time as we increase our value of r. What about other types of orbitals, though? Let's tackle what this 2p orbital looks like. So I'm going to change my value of l, and now you'll see on my drop-down window I have a 2pz, 2px, and 2py orbital that I can choose from. So let's focus first on L. You'll notice that the shape of our wave function changed pretty dramatically when I went from n equals, from L equals 0 to L equals 1. So the effect of L is that it's going to change the shape of my wave function. If you've heard a p orbital described as sort of a dumbbell shape, then that's exactly what's happening here. We have not a radial node, it's our wave function isn't changing value necessarily as we change our value of r, but there is what's called an angular node present. There's a line along this x-axis in this particular instance where there's no electron density or the wave function is strictly zero. So we call that one an angular node, and then I want you to notice that if you've ever seen p orbitals represented as dumbbells where one half of the lobe is one color, the other half of the lobe is a different color, or if you're looking at a black and white image, you'll see one half of the lobe shaded, the other half unshaded. This is the reason why. It's to represent that one half of this lobe is a positive value of the wave function, and one half of the lobe is a negative value of the wave function. It's pretty neat, right? I was flabbergasted when I finally realized in GChem why everyone had been coloring orbitals this whole time. I just thought it was I don't know, like a, an aesthetic, but no, it turns out it contains really important information about the wave function that we're going to use once we start talking about what wave functions look like for molecules. Now, there's, because if you remember what our wave function looked like, those spherical harmonics were multiplied by a, an imaginary portion, and chemists like to represent orbitals in real space. And so what you're going to see on this slider, and this may surprise you, is not values of m sub l, negative 1, 0, 1. You can do that if you use the physicist version of these orbitals, but then our m equals negative 1 orbital and our m equals positive 1 orbital are going to look a little different 
than you might have expected it to because of these imaginary pieces. As chemists, we transform this m sub l variable into names and associated linear combinations of mathematical wave functions. So the number of orbitals that our values of m sub l predicts is always going to be the same. In this case, n equals 2, l equals 0 leads to three possible values of m sub l, negative 1, 0, and 1. And we see, correspondingly, three different types of p orbitals. But they're not named explicitly using l values of m sub l. Instead, we give them names that, most, that best describe what this orbital looks like in space. And so I'm going to move my orientation of this orbital a little bit so that you can see that my pz orbital is oriented in the z direction. And then without changing this, I'm going to show you that then py is oriented in the y direction, px is oriented in the x direction, which since it's kind of coming in and out of the plane of the board, it'll be best if I rotate my applet so that you can see this pointing very distinctly in the x direction. And so m sub l, it appears, is what controls the orientation of the orbital. It doesn't control its size, it doesn't control its shape, and unless you put a coordinate axis onto your system, it's kind of hard to tell what value of m sub l you're talking about. So when we need to distinguish between orbitals as chemists, it's always helpful to draw a coordinate axis so that you can describe whether you're talking about the px, py, or pz orbital. And then last but not least, I think it's just fun to see versions of orbitals in higher dimension. You can see a 3p orbital still has this dumbbell shape, but also a radial node. So it kind of looks like your p orbital from gchem, but also a little bit more complicated than that when we get to higher values of n. So this is our 3p orbital. We could also talk about what 3d orbitals look like. If you're an inorganic chemist, this is something that has to appeal to you because we have these unique kind of donut shape or cross shaped orbitals showing up. And of course, if we go to higher values of n and larger values of L, these orbitals in space can look quite complicated, but also quite interesting. As chemists on the periodic table, most of us are really dealing with the first couple rows of the periodic table, in which case we won't get to see these interesting orbitals in practice. But if you happen to work with elements in the lanthanide or the actinide series in chemistry, you could get to see these 4f, 5f orbitals all over the place, and they can be really unique shapes. Okay, but enough about that. Let's go back to talking about a couple other visualizations that you might see. Because while this applet is really great for being able to scroll around and visualize the wave function, there is no way that we would be able to draw this by hand. And so we also need alternate representations of the wave function that you could either print in a textbook or draw yourself. And so of these, um, hopefully we've been able to, through this applet, answer a couple of questions. The size of an orbital changes with increasing n in that as n increases, size increases. So that is our physical, one of our physical meanings or the importance of this n quantum number. The shape of the orbital doesn't really change with n. And then of course the shape of an orbital changes pretty dramatically with L. So we might describe L equals zero as a sphere or an S orbital. We could describe our L equals one orbital as a dumbbell or a P orbital. I'm pretty sure that there's not two Bs in dumbbell, but we're just gonna make a wild guess as to the spelling. And then our D orbitals have many unique shapes associated with them. Um, so you might see some of them that are X-shaped or kind of like pacifier shaped, if you like, for that DZ squared orbital. But clearly L is what's dictating the shape of our orbital. 
And then last but not least, at the beginning of lecture, we talked about R, the radial wave function, for the 2s orbital. And I want to make sure that we see the connection between our one-dimensional graph of the radial wave function and our three-dimensional graph of the 2s orbital. In particular, as we, on our one-dimensional graph, increase the value of R, it's as if we're trans transitioning, starting at the nucleus and then going outwards. And so as we make this journey along one value of theta and phi, but varying r, we see that we go from positive through a radial node to negative regions and then back to zero, which is exactly what we see on our one-dimensional graph. Another way that you might have seen of drawing these electron densities, or drawing what the wave function looks like, is a so-called electron density plot. The strategy here is that you represent the sign of the wave function using color, just like before, but now we're going to represent the magnitude of the wave function using a bunch of computerized dots. The more dots, the larger the value of psi squared our probability is going to be. And so what I really like about this is that this best matches my intuition for how an experiment might occur where we figure out where these electrons are located in space. And so as a function of time, you know, you keep measuring the electron and you make a dot every time you observe it in a particular location. If I keep doing this, I'm going to get more and more dots in highly probable regions for my wave function. And every once in a while, I might get a dot in a less probable region. And so my dot density plot is trying to show me that this PZ orbital looks dumbbell shaped and most of the electron density is concentrated fairly close to the nucleus. We could maybe draw a circle to represent where that you know, majority of our electron density lies. And then correspondingly, there is another node that is equally probable for the electron to be, but the difference is that the sign of the wave function is different. The con for this, of course, is that it's still not something you can draw by hand, and frequently these pictures are drawn as 2D slices, not as something that you can visualize in three-dimensional space using computer software. So we're kind of in a, this is what you'll frequently see in textbooks, but it's not 3D, but it's not drawn, drawable by hand either, so it's kind of in this middle ground. If we want to draw these orbitals by hand, this is where we need to start talking about an alternate representation, option three, for how to represent these orbitals. And these are referred to as isodensity surfaces. So the strategy for an isodensity surface is to say, look, let's pick some value of the wave function that's really small. So it represents maybe a 5% chance of the electron being in a particular place when I square psi. Then I'm going to draw, if I was in 2D, a line around that region where the wave function is small but constant. So I can do my best to try and draw what that would look like for, you know, encapsulating up to regions of space where the electron is very probable to be found. So I'm kind of excluding these outlier regions, but including everything where psi has a very positive value associated with it. And I'll draw a second contour in a different color that uh, hopefully will be within the limits of my art skills, symmetric, that represents a contour for the wave function being um, negative in value, but still having a very high probability of the electron being there. Since again, psi squared is what tells us about probability, and psi squared doesn't care about the sign of the underlying wave function. In two dimensions, this is called a contour plot. In three dimensions, you would call this a contour surface. And that contour surface is where these shapes of orbitals, which may look very familiar to you from your GChem textbook, show up. The advantage of this is that it's easy to draw these by hand. If I am at a conference chatting with folks and trying to draw an S orbital, I'm gonna draw it very simply in sort of a contour style way to say, my 1s orbital is pretty small. It's spherically symmetric. Its contour looks kind of like this. I can draw a 2s orbital 
as saying this is an orbital where the electron has more space to exist, so it's bigger. And I can also draw my 2p orbital simply using even this dumbbell shape and shading one region to very simply talk about what these orbital shapes look like. Now, a disadvantage of this way of representing the wave function is that actually in doing this we've lost a lot of information. You'll notice that my these isodensity surfaces or these contours don't tell me anything about the magnitude of psi aside from sort of a bounding surface where we know it's really small outside. So outside of this surface psi is small and inside the surface we know that psi is big enough to be counted as part of this orbital. But nothing in this tells me that in the s orbital the really probable region is closer to the nucleus or that in a 2s orbital there's a region of space where there's actually zero probability of seeing the electron. These contour plots just show us if you like the outside of what an orbital looks like not what the inside looks like, not what the magnitude of psi looks like. And so if you haven't been familiarized with what the radial nodes look like, for example, in a 2s orbital, and you just thought that a 2s orbital was just a bigger 1s orbital, that is probably a bit of a misinformation that's easy to stumble into when you just draw these contour plots. And so as we're drawing and trying to visualize the wave function, I would say that a combination of all these different styles of representing the wave function is most useful in order for us to be able to get the most information out of this as possible. Now I promised you that we would summarize or talk about the meaning of our various quantum numbers and hopefully these are all ideas that are mostly summarized from the talk that we had and the little sandbox exploration we did when we went through what the radial wave function looks like and what our three-dimensional wave function looks like. So now you can hopefully see that n, our principal quantum number, using that formula we had at the beginning of lecture for the energy of the orbital, for hydrogen, it exclusively determines the energy of what that orbital looks like. Now, I put a little orange caveat that once we start talking about multi-electron atoms, that's not going to be true, and n and l will both contribute to the energy of an orbital. But for hydrogen, n exclusively determines its energy. You also may have noticed that n largely controls the size of an orbital, especially if we're drawing it in a contour style plot. The 2s orbital is bigger than the 1s orbital, and the 3s orbital is bigger than all of those. And then last but not least, n has an important impact on the number of radial nodes in an orbital. And as n increases, so does the number of radial nodes. L, our angular momentum quantum number, we saw that it was the primary determiner of the shape of an orbital it has an impact on both the number of radial nodes and on the number of angular nodes. It turns out that the radial nodes effect you already saw, but our angular node effect is that the number of angular nodes is equal to L. So an S orbital has zero angular nodes, a P orbital has one angular nodes, and a D orbital has two angular nodes. L, like I said above, doesn't affect the energy for hydrogen, but it will impact the energy for multi-electron atoms. Last but not least, we have our magnetic quantum number. It controls the orientation of an orbital, and you saw that for our three different values of M sub L for these P orbitals, it leads to orientations in the Z direction, X direction and Y direction for our orbital. M sub L never affects the energy, even for multi-electron atoms. And you can maybe see that degeneracy in terms of what the shape of the wave function looks like. If you take away the coordinate axis, you can't tell by symmetry which value of M sub L you have. And so correspondingly, you end up with energies that are fully degenerate, um, where meaning that the energy of an orbital is independent of M sub L. The next thing that I want to talk about for today is how we relate the shapes of these orbitals to probability distributions. So to guide us, our guiding question is going to be, for a given orbital, how far away is the electron from the nucleus? And because we're dealing with quantum mechanics, it is not appropriate to talk about one position of the electron as a di in a distance from the nucleus. 
we have to talk about probabilities. And the language of probabilities, the idea of probabilities, is going to be identical between our particle in a line or particle in a box treatment and the hydrogen atom orbital. It's just that we have to make a mathematical nuance about how to represent these probabilities in spherical coordinates. So in spherical coordinates, our probability density is little p times d tau. d tau represents a really small volume element in spherical coordinates. If we were in Cartesian coordinates, it would be an infinitesimally small box. In Cartesian coordinates, though, it's going to take on a slightly different shape that, if you haven't taken multivariable calculus, will probably look new to you. d tau in spherical coordinates, our volume element, is equal to r squared sine theta d theta d phi dr. Meaning that if I want to think about the probability that a particle is to be found between some values of r, some values of phi, and some values of theta, my integrand actually has an extra factor of r squared and sine theta showing up in my computation of this probability. And so unlike Cartesian coordinates, where we just needed to do p of x dx, now in spherical coordinates, if I'm thinking about the radial portion, I need to do r squared, little r squared, times capital R squared, dr, in order to get that same probability. Now, multi into multiple integrations mean that, just like in partial differentiation, you can separate out the integral if you know that part of your integral doesn't depend on some of the coordinates. So I can separate out the r dependence in my integral from the angular dependence. And it's so great for us that y squared is normalized because it means that this whole angular portion of the integral, if I am interested in just how p depends on distance, not worrying about the angles, so saying you can be any angle you want, but I just want to know how does this probability of observing the electron somewhere change as I change r, then this latter term representing the angular probability distribution go, integrates out to 1. And so chemists have defined what's called the radial distribution function as the term, the second term, that shows up in the front of my integral that relates to dr. So my radial distribution function is little r squared times r squared. And that means that the probability that p of r dr represents the probability by definition that the particle lies a distance from the nucleus between r and r plus dr. So if we use this probability this radial distribution function, we can now, for instance, compute the probability that the electron is between two radii. So what's the probability, for instance, that the electron is anywhere from the nucleus up until r equals 5 angstrom, or between 2 angstrom and 7 angstrom. And not only that, but then it lets us know that if I just want to visually look at where I should expect the electron to most probably be in terms of a distance away from the nucleus, it would be best for me not to plot just r, the radial wave function, but to plot p of r. And so using my plots for p of r, this is going to help me understand a little bit better what my radial distribution function should look like and will better help me graph how I should think about the radial wave function relating to the probability of observing an electron somewhere. And so in my nice notebook, um, the Python notebook that I've given for us, I have also made some sliders to represent the radial function and the probability distribution. And so let me start off by having us notice that the, the P of R is related to um, multiplication between R squared, a term that grows very rapidly as R gets bigger. And in fact, you'll notice that when I was trying to put the radial wave function squared and little r squared on the same graph, I actually had to use two different y-axes because this blue curve has very small values and this red curve has very large values. But what that means for my overall radial distribution, my radial distribution function p of r, is that the purple curve is going to look similar to but not identical to this, to the blue curve because it's a product 
of whatever the value is for the red curve times whatever the value is the blue curve to generate these functions. And what's really noticeable is how this relates to the probabilities for, for instance, our s orbitals. And so for my 1s orbital, you'll notice that the value of the radial wave function was very positive at r equals 0. But it, when it comes to thinking about the probability that the electron is found at a distance 0 away from the nucleus, that probability is 0. In other words, the electron, even despite what this radial wave function looks like, when we compute the probability, can't exist right on top of the nucleus. There is a peak, a maximum peak, where this electron is most likely to be, and that peak for my 1s orbital ends up appearing at one angst or one bore radius. Exactly one bore radius. Let me see if I can zoom out on this a little bit for us. As I change my slider values for n and l, I want you to notice what the difference is between r squared and p of r for my 2s orbital, where really interestingly, because this red term, r, little r squared, is blowing up so fast, it means that the most probable position for the electron in a 2s orbital is to be a distance 5 bore, or a little bit more than 5 bore, away from the nucleus. And as n goes up to a value of 3, we again see that now the most probable value of the electron in terms of a distance away from the nucleus is more, you know, closer to 15 bore. So when we talk about n having an effect on the size of the orbital, really what we're saying is that as n increases, the electron spends more and more time farther away from the nucleus, and both the most probable position of the electron and the average position of the electron increase in radius. For our p-type orbitals, let's go ahead and start talking about the 2p orbital. You'll notice that here my shape between r squared and p of r looks a little bit more similar, but again, there's zero probability of the p orbital being the p electron being found at the nucleus. And as I increase n, I'm going to see that that electron in a p orbital is again going to be found both in terms of a most probable sense and in terms of an average sense farther and farther away from the nucleus. And so with that, let's go back to a discussion of what our 1s orbital looks like. And so I'm going to try and pull up the chart of just what p of r looks like for you to be able to visualize. And I want us to think about this question first based on this graph, which is a probability distribution, once I fix my sliders, for the 1s orbital. What is the most probable position of this particle in a 1s orbital? Go ahead and pause the video and see if you can determine from the graph where this most probable distance would be, at least in an approximate sense. Now, if you did this correctly, you'll notice that where the electron is most probable to be found in terms of a distance is where this purple curve is at, a, is at a maximum. And that maximum occurs, if you do the math for it, at a distance of one angstrom away from the nucleus. I can determine that visibly, or I can determine that using a little bit of calculus and taking the derivative of p of r and finding where it's at a maximum. A second related question that I could answer is, what is the average distance of the electron from the nucleus? I'm going to, in a second, answer this question mathematically, but right now I want you to pause the video and try and determine for yourself, do you expect the average distance of the electron from the nucleus in this 1s orbital to be at 1 bore, so the same as the most probable position, smaller than 1 bore, or larger than 1 bore, and why? Now, because my distribution is skewed, notice that there's a big probability tail to the right that doesn't exist to the left. 
I would contend that we're hoping to see an average value of r that is, is larger than the most probable value in this case because of our skewed distribution that has a bias towards more probable distances being to the right. You can do the calculus for this. Our expectation values are going to be found by the formula since we're computing the expected value of r. It's going to be r times p of r dr. And if you actually do the math for this, my couple of calculus lines here work through integration by parts. You have to use a couple times. And I'm not going to go through that in the interest of time. But we end up with a value of 3 halves a naught, which does match the, our physical intuition that if this purple curve is representing a probability distribution, then because it's skewed to the right, our average should be to the right of where the peak of this curve occurs. And then last but not least, I want you to pause the video and try and answer the question, why is it for any value of R, of capital R, why is it that P of R equals zero is equal to zero? Well, the answer to this question is that P of R, if you remember, is equal to little r squared times capital R squared. This little r squared term is equal to zero at r equals zero. And so if my r squared term is equal to zero, that means that the overall probability distribution guarantees for any wave function that there's zero probability of observing the electron right on top of the nucleus. All right, so last but not least, I wanna have a quick discussion of our energy level diagrams in hydrogen atomic atoms. What does those look like and what should we learn from this? So recall from last lecture and the beginning of this lecture, maybe an important expression for us to remember, the energy of a hydrogen-like atom is our physical constants and inversely proportional to n squared and gives us a negative value. And so if we wanted to draw an energy level diagram for, for instance, a hydrogen atom, we should make sure that our orbital energies are all represented on this plot. So my lowest value of energy is going to correspond to the n equals 1 level. And hopefully you remember from GChem that there's only one orbital type that's allowed at the n equals 1 level, and that is my 1s orbital. If you like better to use our pchem notation that we're starting to use, that corresponds to n equals 1, l equals 0, and m sub l is equal to 0. Now, if we go higher in energy, which is going to correspond to the n equals 2 level, I expect that the 2s orbital will be present, and that because l can also equal 1 if n equals 2, we're going to have some 2p orbital showing up. For the hydrogen atom, these are degenerate in energy with one another. And so we have three different flavors of 2p orbitals. I'm not going to distinguish which is which in this case, but we know that one of these lines is going to correspond to 2px, one of these lines will correspond to 2PY, and one of them will correspond to 2PZ. Or, if you like better, we've got Psi of 2, 1, 0, Psi of 2, 1, 1, and Psi of 2, 1, negative 1 as our three allowed wave functions. And of course, this 2S orbital is psi two zero zero. And so using this energy level diagram, notice that because the energy is dependent on the inverse of n, as we go to higher n values, our energy levels are going to get closer and closer together. So at the n equals 3 level, I've got s, p, and d orbitals that can show up, 3p orbitals, 5d orbitals,
and at higher and higher values of n, eventually these energies are going to converge together such that at really large values of n, all the energies are, end up being really close to zero. Just like in the particle in a box model, energy transitions between orbitals lead to either the emission or the absorption of light. And so for our, for our hydrogen orbitals, a number of these energy transitions are really well studied in the literature and they're often noted by the name of the individual that discovered them. And so for our different series, the Balmer series is probably the one that you're most familiar with because that leads to visible light emission in our hydrogen emission spectrum. But the Lyman series is an IR way of discovering some of the transitions leading to the n equals one level in hydrogen. And the Passion series is a, in the UV region talking about energy transitions where the final state of the electron is n equals three. And so our formula for computing the energy differences between these n levels is just given by me taking my expression for E sub n and plugging in n final minus n initial. That then gives rise to a, form a, a formula that you may be very familiar with from GChem. This, in fact, if we recognize that a lot of these constants form our overall Rydberg constant, this is the Rydberg energy expression that you had in GChem when you were trying to solve for the hydrogen emission spectrum using the Bohr model. And so note that we derive this expression from Schrodinger's equation. This is accurate quantum mechanics, but this Rydberg formula, which was determined empirically in the Bohr model, which had some good and some bad assumptions associated with it, have gotten this formula right, even if they had other aspects of quantum mechanics gotten a little bit wrong. And so with that, we've talked today about a number of applications and implications of the hydrogen atom. And the takeaways that I wanna leave us with for today is first of all, that each quantum number in a hydrogen-like atom contributes to information about psi and the energy of that orbital in unique and interesting ways. N as a quantum number determines the size and energy of the orbital, and it positively impacts the number of radial nodes present. L determines the shape of the orbital. It contributes to both the number of radial nodes and the number of angular nodes present. And last but not least, M sub L determines the orientation of the orbital in space. A second takeaway is that while visualizing the wave function is tricky because of the number of dimensions that we have to represent, most representations at least capture the overall size and shape of an orbital. And you should from here on out, not only expect to see orbitals drawn with either two different shades if you're black and white or colors if you have a color textbook to represent the sign of the wave function, but I also want you to make that connection in terms of color and sign of the wave function, because it'll be very important to us once we start talking about molecular orbitals and molecular orbital theory. A third takeaway is that we, if we wanna talk about probabilities for an electron in spherical coordinates, we needed to define a radial distribution function, which determines the probability of observing the electron at a distance from the nucleus between r and r plus an infinitesimal amount dr away from the nucleus. So all of our formulas, Ehrenfest theorem, our probability expectation value formulas, those all work for the hydrogen atom. But we need to replace p of x, which is the one dimensional probability we were dealing with before in Cartesian coordinates, with p of r dr, little r squared times the radial wave function squared dr. And then last but not least, the energy of our hydrogen-like atomic orbital is given by a number of physical constants times the atomic number squared divided by n squared. And so computed energy transitions between orbitals exactly match the hydrogen emission spectrum that has been measured experimentally by a number of different researchers. And so if you're familiar with the Rydberg formula or Bohr's model, this is where a connection can be made between those more approximate theories and this true quantum mechanical theory we developed over the last couple of lectures using Schrodinger's equation. And so with that, that's all that I've got for us for today. Stay tuned where we'll do some practice problems and then we're gonna start talking on the next lecture about mini electron atoms. Take care folks.